everyone, and welcome to the Platitude Era podcast. In this episode of the podcast, we will be reviewing the movie Lion King 2019 movie review. So uh, once we go through these reviews, we're big time movie fans and we go through each little detail of the movie. First, we like to start off with the marketing, which I would grade the marketing A because it's a Disney movie and they really go all out. They do the ads, they do the billboards, radio, uh, YouTube, they do the critics, the premieres, they make it an event. And in this case, everyone remembers The Lion King, the original animated movie from the 90s. And people were expecting something on that level, something on that epic scale. And, you know, the marketing did work because the movie grossed over $180 million over the weekend. What do you think about the marketing? Uh, I mean, I think we. I say this every time we review a Disney movie, especially these remakes, which is, I mean, I saw the original and even though I've seen the same one before, uh, cause it's Disney and cause you gotta know you're going to, you're going to walk in the movie theater on opening weekend. It's just, you know, they, they got us on habit. Now they, they hooked us up on the IV where we're, we're, we're hooked in and suckered in where we're always going to watch it every single time, even though their track record is mostly shit for these live action or remakes or whatever. It doesn't matter how many times they do it. They're still going to get, get the audiences in as clearly as, divine by this uh opening box office weekend now when going into this movie in the beginning when it was being announced when the marketing was was being uh was starting to roll out i was really excited and looking forward to this just because john favreau the director did some decent work with the jungle book and well, I was a lot look- of people loved the jungle book i i was fine with it I, I i don't know i don't know why people were so in love with it so enamored by it but uh I kind of looked at it and like, yeah, it's fine, I guess. So I don't know. I was I was interested because like people were excited for this. Oh, Jan- John Favreau's doing the Lion King just like he did the Jungle Book. It's got to be good, right? Correct. And then the critic score started coming out. Uh, right now, it's at a fifty-two percent. So I was thinking, um, I'm not excited for it anymore. It was like uh, watching the critic scores drop. It was a gut punch to me. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't remember we listening to that many critics on YouTube. I remember I listened to one and he was just like, eh, whatever, take it or leave it. I'm just so excited that it's over now because I don't have to talk about it. The confusing part is, is it an animated film? Is it a live action film? You can't consider it a live action film because their lines are CG. They're not real lines. Hello? Yeah, you didn't really have a question. You just kind of finished your statement yeah i finished i don't know how to respond to a statement yes i yes (laughs) you said words i was hoping you would move on to the to the next topic or if you wanted to continue with that topic uh next we talk about the story so hey it's a remake of the lion king uh you've seen it before you've seen it again but maybe you're saying "Whoa, whoa hold on a second uh jungle book there was some slight uh deviation from the original there were a little bit of like john favreau put his own touch on it what about in this one well me i'll tell you that i felt this version of the lion king the 2019 remake what's like somebody seen it before wanted to do it before and they did it based on what they remembered oh i remembered this what yeah about it's oh sorry <laughs> Well, yeah, I was going to say it's pretty one to one where I'm my thought is like for the Jungle Book, it wasn't complete like as beloved as the Lion King. So, you know, for for that movie, they were able to deviate more from the original storyline, whereas for this movie, I feel like they were trapped in a corner where like they try to do something different. People are going to get upset. But if they, you know, they they try and do keep it the same, people are going to get upset. It's kind of a no win situation for this movie. They're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. It's true. Um, just uh, the story, you know, you see some deviation, but it's still within the same original principle. So it kind of gave me that feeling of, oh, it's somebody recalling what the Lion King was because it did hit those notes. And then there was some stuff where it was like, it's not exactly like I remember the Lion King. But if somebody told me if I haven't seen it in a while and somebody told me, hey, what do you remember? Or like, tell me in detail about it. I would kind of 
do some deviation from the original story. Um, not much to say here. I mean, I can't give it a score because they took the original source material and just, like you said, did it one-to-one. Now we go into the acting. Um, you know, you got Donald Glover as Simba, and then you got Beyonce, which are both mega talented people. But in this movie, it seems like you got very little of it. They advertise it a lot, like you were getting these very high profile and talented actors, but they didn't do much. Um, I don't know. I don't remember from the animated movie if it was like a like an equal balance of young versus old Simba, but in this one, I felt I got more younger Simba than, than older Simba, so you got very little Donald Glover and Beyonce. Yeah, that's kind of what I felt too. Like, I feel like the animated version kind of had a pretty decent split between young and old Simba, and then for this one, yeah, I felt like, what, I'm still watching young Simba? Like, Jesus Christ, I'm getting tired of this kid. He's do- getting, like, a bad perform. Like, he- he's doing some pretty terrible reads. I mean, when he sings, he does a pretty good good job. But, like, every time he says any line of dialogue, they're like, Phew, move on from young Simba. Let's see what Donald Glover has to do. But then you never really get to Donald Glover. You know, you get him singing Hakuna Matata, and then I don't remember him saying much when he's all grown up. And then you get him singing, which was like a big uh, promotional thing, was Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Mm. And what threw me off was it felt that uh, while other actors, they pay him like a flat fee for being in a movie. It felt like for Beyonce and Donald Glover, they charged by the hour. Because it was like very, very, very picky how they used them in the movie. Yeah, yeah, I feel like it would make sense, like, Hey, like the 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 kid, like the eight year olds who they got to play a young Simba and Nala. Well, well, they cost dirt cheap because they're not established, and who cares about them? So, like, we'll make them the bulk of the movie, and then uh, Beyonce is costing us a hell of a lot of money, and <laughs> and Donald Glover, he's getting up there, so uh, you know he's pretty high end talent. Uh, so uh, we'll 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 take a step back. We'll put him on the poster. That'll get people, that'll get butts and seats. But uh, for the most part, it's. Uh, Twerp, twerp and Twerpet, that's their movie. <laughs> and then now we're moving on to the directing. So I felt that uh, John Favreau, with each project that he does, uh, he gets better and better. And if there were some shots in there, the way the camera followed the action, that were really good. And I'm like, wow, John Favreau, from the guy that started in Swingers, that you'd never think he'd, he'd be handling these big projects, moving on to Iron Man to just being Disney's go-to guy, uh, he keeps getting better and better as far as directing. Yeah, well, I don't know, because I know there was, like, a couple of shots that, I mean, they're pretty much one for one. You just put, like, copy-pasted from the original movie. It's like, oh, there's that one shot where, you know, uh, Simba sees Mufasa die, and then you're going to zoom in on his face, or, you know, there's like, oh, they just ripped that straight from the animated movie. And then, I think there was a, a handful of shots here and there, like, oh, that looks clever, that looks interesting, but, like, Nothing I can't remember, so I I guess I can qualify it as not memorable. So, but so I don't know. I get in the same way that like, hey, it stays. This movie is like, it stays. It's a copy paste of the original, and then there's minor tweaks, you know, of originality. I guess I can say the same thing for his directing. Uh, you know, if you need some help with his directing, uh, the one scene that really caught my attention was when little Simba goes into the elephant graveyard and he's trying to run away from the hyenas. How mm-hmm. The camera does like this uh, action Simba point of view where he's trying to run away and he runs into this little what little tunnel. And then yeah. you see the hyenas prop their heads in through these little holes trying to bite him and, and like they stick their claws in trying to trying to grab him. That, that's what uh, I remember. Yeah, I think that might be one of the shots. Yeah. There was another one, but I forgot it. Exactly. So there are there are blips of creativity, I guess you could say, in the directing or in the cinematography or whatever, but there's they're, they're pretty few and far between that the only thing that sticks out in my head is like, oh yeah, it was just like the first movie. Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I want to complain about it. The uh, Disney execs are maybe saying, hey, you got to do it this way. You got to do it exactly like the source material. And I want to complain about that because when I w- watch these remakes, I want to see something different, somebody's own take on it. And uh, I can't complain because these movies do well at the box office. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And like Jim Carrey said in Liar Liar, I'm going to piss and moan. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you. I mean, just based on this year, you kind of got all sides of the spectrum. Whereas you got Dumbo, which is kind of a, a reimagining, I guess you could say. It's it's not a, truly faithful to the original cartoon, and that was kind of poorly received. And then you have Aladdin, which is kind of a hybrid of the same movie and a mix of like you know kind of new content. And then I think that was also critically panned. And then you have this movie, which pretty much stays true to the original source material and then that was also critically planned so you in the critics eyes you have three strikes but in the audience except except for dumbo you have like three three uh knockouts so i, I don't know yeah you know i mean i guess you can't complain either right like you really want to complain but you can't i mean i can't complain in the sense that like yeah i guess it was the same so i'm kind of in the same boat as the critics but i'm in the same in the same vein, I'm also like, oh, yeah, but what were you expecting? Oh, you know, as far as um, the movie goes, when I say directing, I refer to everything. And mm-hmm. then there was like uh, one thing where there was a couple times where it happened where it seems like there was more to this movie, but they they cut it out. And I guess they were trying to make it shorter. And while I was sitting watching the movie, it was starting to put me to sleep. And I don't know if you felt the same way, too, where it was like, oh, man, this is putting me to sleep. It's not boring, but I'm getting sleepy. I guess that's a pacing issue where, like, I think this movie's two hours, whereas the original is probably sub 90 minutes. So, like, they they expounded on a couple of things here and there. Like, there was, like, a whole stealth, like, a splinter cell stealth sequence to where Nala's trying to escape from the Pride Rock. And that took up a fair bit of time, even though like it didn't matter. I don't remember that be- that scene being like in the original movie. So, so like there's like beats like and, you know, we were complaining like, oh, young Simba just keeps going and going. And like there's barely that much Donald Glover. So I guess they stretched some bits out and then they they kind of skimped on other bits like, hey, where's Rafiki? There's not enough Rafiki. He brings some nice levity, levity into this movie. Hey, uh, Timon and Pumbaa, I like them a lot. And kind of feels like I'm kind of watching more of Timon and Pumbaa than I saw in Lion King one and a half. What's going on here? <laughs> Timon and Pumbaa, the, the two actors that played them, really saved the movie. Uh, I was falling asleep. And then once Timon and Pumbaa came on screen, uh, I just woke up and I started enjoying it. Uh, the yeah. actors there were Seth Rogen. And uh, who was the actor that played uh, Timon? Uh, Billy Eichner. Billy Eichner. I... I starting to love more and more his work, whether he's in American horror stories or um, trying to remember what else I saw him in before this Uh, parks and rec parks and rec. uh, He's the funny librarian in um, Bob's burgers. Yeah. He's done a handful of stuff. I'm thinking like there's a, there's like a number of times where like I was watch like watching the movie and then a lot of like lines delivered felt like there's this, there's nothing really gelling with me here. And it almost felt like, uh, I guess they're like all just because they're such huge names. They all just read their lines individually and they're they're not playing off of each other. Whereas why did Timon and Pumbaa work so well? And it's because they both those actors record their lines together. So they're able to bounce back and forth off of each other and bring a little more liveliness. Whereas everyone else just like just felt so kind of bland and monotone. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah, Zazu's saying funny things, but it like he doesn't feel like he's bouncing off of everybody else. So like. I'm guessing he was by himself when he recorded his lines and that's why it doesn't feel, you know, I feel like I'm watching like, like a puzzle, like, like puzzle pieces being laid on top of each other or whatever, like animation went here, voiceover went here, music went here. And like that, like c- scenes from those actors, you know, didn't feel right to me. And then scenes from Timon and Pumbaa, you know, at least their dialogue felt more, felt better to me, felt like a little warmer, less you know, robotic. You- you said it really well. I couldn't figure it out in the way you described it. This is what their performance are like, except for Timon and Pumbaa. Mm-hmm. Every actor's performance is like this. You're trying to watch a tennis game between two people, but the other person didn't show up. So you got the one guy that serves, hits the ball, and then the ball just bounces and doesn't come back. That, that's what it feels like, watching a tennis game where it's one person playing against themselves. Yeah, like in, in a similar... I guess, you know, in a mirror, in some sequence, whatever, in this movie, you have like the two hyenas, one of them played by Eric Andre and the other by Keegan-Michael Key. You think a similar like dynamic between Timon and Pumbaa would play off between them, but like there's like, 
their sequences or their scenes felt kind of flat too. Like I don't, maybe they didn't they didn't record them together either. But like I don't know. Like they're saying funny things, but I'm not laughing because I don't know. It's just maybe. Well, both their voices kind of sounded the same, so that didn't help. But just <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it, just, it didn't it didn't work for me the same way as Timon and Pumbaa. I'd rather have watched a Timon, Timon and Pumbaa movie. How about you remake Lion King one and a half instead of what you made this this go around? Yeah, I I really like the uh, Timon and Pumbaa, just that whole, uh, you know, Simba, Mufasa. There was like two different, I don't know, attitudes in the movie. There was Simba, Mufasa, and they were talking about the circle of life. And it's pretty much feels like somebody pushing a religion on you. Mm. And then I like uh, Timon and Pumbaa. It's like Hakuna Matata. And the way that the theme of, of that scene, when they introduce him, it's like, hey, you know, do your own thing. Have fun. Life is short. And I guess it's like, that's why it, it feels unbalanced because you got two different tones in this. Yeah, agree. And uh, what's what's your recommendation? Uh, I mean, for fan, for like, if you got little kids, go ahead and take them because they ain't never seen the original, I guess. And it, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't have nostalgia for the original. But I, I think the original is just still superior i mean visually i think it's more interesting i mean acting wise it's better like the musical segments are better everything about the original is better and that's what 30 minutes shorter more or less it's i mean this movie's in a tough place where it has to compare itself to the original like this movie's not bad i think if i if i took out the original i took the original out of the equation i'd probably say yeah this is a good movie i didn't i enjoyed it a lot but because it has to compare itself to the original it winds up falling short um for me i'm gonna sound really stupid saying this i i can't recommend this remake the 2019 i can't recommend it to anyone to watch it yet it did so well at the box office the movie theater that we saw it in everybody that was watching it did enjoy it well i mean because it was the same movie i'm thinking that's why audiences are at a much higher score than critics is because i mean they got what they paid for, which was to watch the Lion King again. I don't, I don't think they really, I don't know, maybe they're more brainless, mindless husks of consumer consumers, but like, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm watching Lion King again. It's really good. And not to doubt, even though I just insulted everybody that watched <laughs> it, not to diss them, but like, I guess they don't have as much of a critical eye. And, but then again, I also hate the critics for like, you know, being so, so dismissive of this movie, even though I'm kind of on their side too. I don't know. This movie's too divisive. <laughs> and uh, speaking of brainless, <laughs> there's this funny anecdote that happened when we saw the movie. Uh, we were just talking about this, you and I. Timon and Puba come in, and then they talk about Hakuna Matata. And uh, nobody did anything in it. They're like, Hakuna Matata! And then they turn to the to the camera, and they say, usually when we say that, people clap. And I took it as, oh, hey, this is the part where you're supposed to clap. You know, like in Aladdin where Genie has that sign after his musical number that says applause. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I guess it's like an inside joke where the audience is supposed to clap. And I clap and nobody else claps and nobody else got into the song Hakuna Matata. I mean, everybody loves that. Hakuna Matata. Yeah. And, but and you're watching a movie. I mean, the idiots in the in the auditorium, they clapped at moments they didn't need. Cl- I mean, you're watching a movie. The- on the screen aren't actually in front of you so you don't need to clap when a thing you like happens you don't need to clap after like the uh nasa whatever song starts and then you hear, like see the title card this is a lion king you don't need to clap <laughs> during every single every single beat that makes you go ooh and ah so like for that one bit where a joke hap- a pretty clever joke happens but you know the audience didn't fall for it where like you know they say akuna matata and you know the dumb idiots are supposed to clap they didn't clap and then they make reference to the joke and then dumb idiot decides to clap after the fact. And that makes it super not work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, but once we got into the third act of the film, then just everyone just started clapping to realize, Oh, Hey, we're supposed to clap. They clapped uh, at the end of the, the resolution of the conflict. They clapped mm-hmm. during key moments that I guess we'll talk about in the spoiler. It's, um, it's a 25 year old movie who cares there's no spoiler <laughs> section everybody's seen it all right everybody now we're transitioning to the spoiler but uh you don't have to pause you don't have to leave because hey like you said it's a 25 year old movie you've seen it you know all the beats 
mm-hmm. and we're just gonna cover some things. Uh, one thing that really, really annoyed me, and and I didn't get it, was in the animated film Rafik, his his famous staff that he uses throughout the movie. He carries it around. Uh, you think it's his walking cane, and later you realize it's his Jedi weapon, like the guy from Rogue One. I am one with the Force. The Force is with me. Mm. And uh, he doesn't have it. And then when it, you approach the third act, where it's the big battle, uh, he, he pulls it out, and the way the scene is framed, it's kind of like in Avengers when Thor is picking up uh, his hammer before the third act again. You know, it's slow. You got the different shots. He pulls it out. I think he even says... I never thought I was going to need this again. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's barely in it, so it's it's kind of weird to like, like, oh, yeah, Rafiki, we're going to see Rafiki go to town on this movie. But like, <laughs> I don't even remember them saying his name in the movie. That's true. That's how inconsequential he was. Yeah. He, even when he had to do the baptism, he did more in the animated than in, in the live. He just, you know, painted Simba, gave him a few like paints, and that's it. Hmm. Uh, another thing, I mean, you already mentioned it about Nala. They made a big deal about it. I know that wasn't in the animated because when I first saw the movie, I liked the way they set it up where it was just Pumbaa in the animated movie from 1994. It was just minding his own business. And then just this lion, lioness sneaks up behind him and you're like, oh shit, it's Nala. But in this one, they make this big deal about Nala trying to escape the pride, find a better place to go. Mm-hmm. And and it's like, oh, now I know where they're going. Simba and, and Nala are going to meet. So, well, that... I mean, it's no big twist. You've seen the movie, so the original. So it shouldn't shock you. But I guess. I, true. I, I found it annoying. It was like they were telegraphing it. Well, uh, it felt even more telegraphed <laughs> when they were like singing the line sleeps tonight for two and a half minutes. I'm like, when are they going to get to Nala pouncing on them? I get it. Nala's going to pounce on them. <laughs> but it was very exciting. Uh, I think that was one of my favorite songs in the movie. Just the way they presented it was when mm-hmm. the line sleeps tonight. They had good rhythm, good chemistry, just uh, everyone included. Um, they didn't make, uh, I just, Simba sings a song, I Can't Wait to Be King. They mm-hmm. didn't make it as eventful as in the animated film. I was going to say that, like, yeah, it, it feels very hollow because, like, when you watch the origi- in the original, it's, like, more colorful. It feels like, like a musical, like a Broadway play or something because there's just, like, a lot of lights and colors and just, like, it's more visually interesting because it's an animated movie. Whereas in this, it's just kind of, like, a bunch of animals, like, walking towards the screen. Like, oh, there's, yeah, there's, like, zebras and hippos and giraffes and stuff, like, but that's it. They're just, like, because this is a, a, supposed to be a realistic take on, like of animals doing that these actions that they can't do anything more fantastical. So like that whole sequence, I guess was kind of telling for the rest of the movie that was just going to be kind of not as visually interesting because it's not an actual cartoon. And uh, when they, what was it when they re-released the animated film or when they, what re-released the DVD, they added an additional song, the morning report. Mm, it was, I guess, the- Catchy, it was fun. Not in this movie. Well, not necessary. Well, not you got to put the Beyonce song, which I don't remember the lyrics to, but sure. When did they put that? It felt like they shoehorned the Beyonce song, the new song, Spirit. It was like right at like Simba decides to be a man and then he catches up with Nala as they're like roaming through the desert and they're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go fight Scar or whatever. And then they, you know, sing her song. And then uh, the theme of the circle of life uh, was a little bit annoying so in the original lion king you have or in the animated version of the lion king simba lays down and it's that famous scene where he lays down on the grass and then the the pollen spells out sex and then what what leaves simba that transfers over to rafiki it's just like a piece of his mane like a little bit of fur that was in the and then it forced gump well i don't remember the i guess it was some dandelions or some shit i don't remember but in this like like Simba turns into Forrest Gump and his feather, <laughs> and then his feather goes all the way over to Rafiki by bizarre, comical, uh, Rube Goldberg esque device that goes through 15 different animals before it finally makes its way to Rafiki. Yeah, and since we're in the spoiler, you can go into, into detail because it does get really stupid the way his, his mane travels. I don't remember the first animal. But like it, it makes its way up to or like a bird picks it up and then a bird makes it its nest 
and then another bird decides that's too bad for its nest and then throws it and then it gets caught in a tree and then a giraffe eats it and then the giraffe shits it out and then a dung beetle rolls it around his his ball breaks and then it gets picked up by an ant and then an ant goes to Rafiki's tree because Rafiki lives with the insects I guess and then he sees the tuft of fur and then he decides Simba's back Simba is back and then they don't <laughs> you don't see Rafiki for a long ass time yeah that that was unnecessary the the animators before didn't like a simple thing in a couple seconds and in this one they did it in like several minutes and it was just too much information well um, i think the problem is like you didn't get enough Raf- like if i got more rafiki and he felt like this wise interesting jedi-esque monkey then like ooh, ooh, look what's going on here then i i think i'd care more but like you see so little rafiki and you care so little about him or just about every character that you know it doesn't seem to matter it's just taking up more time you got anything else to say i'm i'm all lion kinged out nah I, I mean, that's it. There's there's not a whole lot to say. Watch the original. That's about it. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to our podcast, our movie review of The Lion King 2019. Uh, thank you for taking us on the go. You can listen to our podcast on uh, Google, Spotify. Uh, download the Anchor app. Send us a voicemail so we can stay in touch. Or thank you for watching us on the YouTubes at Platitude Era. Send us something in the comment sections. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're watching us on the YouTubes, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, give us a like if you want. Not necessary. Other YouTubers make a big deal about it, but we don't need. We're not insecure and need to be liked. We're already liked enough as it is. Uh, and then click somewhere around the box to uh, watch another video. And I think there's some social media tags if you want to social media us. Uh, I don't know. I'm not that addicted to social media anymore. What about you? I never was. Yeah, so good luck trying to reach us on social media. <laughs> Bye, everyone.